Well, hello again, friends, and welcome to our Saturday summation video where we kind of try to put a bow on the things we have talked about during this particular week. Of course, this week we cover John chapter 13, uh, verses 1 through 38, a uh, story about Jesus washing the feet of the disciples and then the things that uh, started to unfold uh, after that. So we'll uh, hear from Dr. Witherington here in just a little bit. Uh, but before we get there, I want to first uh, open us up in prayer. I'll point out a few key observations from the week. We'll turn it over to Dr. Witherington, and when he's done, we'll close in prayer uh, for this particular time together. So I want to invite you now to join me as we go to the Lord in prayer together. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are always present in the world around me, in my spirit within me, and in the unseen world beyond me. Let me carry with me through this day's life a most real sense of your power and glory. O oh God, around me, forbid that I should look at the work of your hands today and give no thought to you, the maker. Let the heavens declare your glory to me and the hills speak of your majesty. Let every fleeting loveliness I see speak to me of a loveliness that does not fade. Let the beauty of the earth to me be a sacrament which makes real the beauty of holiness revealed in Christ Jesus, my Lord. O oh God, within me, Give me grace today to recognize the stirrings of your spirit within my soul and to listen more attentively to all that you have to say to me. Do not let the noises of this world so confuse me that I cannot hear you speak. Help me never to deceive myself about the meaning of your command. And so help me in all things to obey your will through the grace of Jesus Christ, my Lord. O oh God, beyond me, you dwell in unapproachable light. Teach me that even my highest thoughts of you are but a dim and distant shadow of your transcendent glory. Teach me that if you are in nature, you are still greater than nature. Teach me that if you are in my heart, you are still greater than my heart. Let my soul rejoice in your mysterious greatness. Let me take refuge in the thought that you are utterly beyond me beyond the sweep of my imagination, beyond the comprehension of my mind. Your judgments are unsearchable and your ways past finding out. O oh Lord, hallowed be your name. Amen. All right, so a few key observations to make from our time together this week. Key observation number one, no matter how many times we read the story of Passion Week, there is surely something in all of us that has at least a little hope. Maybe this time things will turn out better. But sometimes it really is necessary for things to get pitch black before there can be a dawn. Key observation number two. Sometimes the 12 look more like the dirty dozen than the terrific 12. And of course, we can all relate to this. Sometimes we are not as faithful as we should be, not as truthful as we should be. We wilt under pressure or run away when the going gets tough. Key observation number three. It is noticeable that here at the end, Jesus takes great pains to instruct his disciples at length, realizing that they would not understand much of what he said until after the fact, and in some cases, long after the fact. Key observation number four, it was Socrates who said, know thyself, but few people really do. One may think he knows how he would respond to a crisis until he gets there and discovers that he responded very differently and in a less flattering way than he had aspired to. And key observation number five, life lived unto God is teleological meaning that it has a purpose and it has a goal. Each person should search out his or her calling and pursue it. A big part of Jesus' calling was to love his disciples to the end. All right, so those are our key observations from this week. And so now I want to turn things over to our good friend, Dr. Ben Witherington III. If John 12 was about an annoying anointing, 
John 13 is about an annoying foot washing. And again, it's a story you find uniquely in the Gospel of John. Scholars have debated for many years whether this is the same story as the story of the Last Supper. My, my suggestion would be it probably is not. It looks to be, like from the indications at the very beginning of John 13, 1 and 2, that this is a story that happened during the week of what we call Passion Week or Passover Week, early in the week. And what the author of the Gospel of John has done is he's blended that story together with some of the elements of the later meal at the end of the week. Most interesting about the Johannine presentation of these meals, the meal in John 12 and the meal in John 13, is that we don't have the words of institution that we associate with the later Lord's Supper, which were announced first at the Last Supper. Nowhere in the Gospel of John do we have, this is my body broken for you, this is my blood shed for you, the blood of the new covenant. We have something similar to it, in John 6, unless you eat of my body and drink of my flesh, you shall not have everlasting life. But we don't have the presentation of the bread and the cup in a meal in the same way in the Gospel of John. And of course, part of the reason is Jesus is presented as the Passover, not merely sharing the Passover or giving a new kind of Passover for his disciples, but as being the Passover lamb in this gospel. Someone who was killed on the day that the lambs were slaughtered for Passover at the end of this week. The John 13 story is important from a variety of points of view because it really highlights the two central disciples that we keep hearing about in this gospel. Peter, on the one hand, and Judas at the very other end of the spectrum. Now, foot washing was an activity that slaves or servants undertook in the ancient Near East. It was not the job for the teacher to wash the feet of his students. On the contrary, it would have been the job of slaves or disciples to do that for their master. And so, it's perfectly understandable why it would be Peter in this story would object, dramatically object, object to Jesus taking off his outer robe, wrapping a towel around himself, getting down on his knees with a basin of water and a towel, and beginning to wash the dirty feet of the disciples. No, Lord, says Peter. His instinctive reaction is one of revulsion. No, this is a complete, complete reversal of roles. Now, you shouldn't be doing this for me. I should be doing this for you. It's the same kind of thing you saw in the baptismal story of Jesus from the beginning of the ministry. John says, I am unworthy even to unlatch your sandals and wash your feet, and yet you want me to baptize you? Very interesting uh, contrast. So what happens in this story, and what's it really all about? Jesus says that unless I cleanse you, unless I make you whole, you cannot participate in the kingdom of God. The story is not about a mere external washing of somebody's tootsies. It's a story about preparing us to be holy and whole so we may enter the kingdom of God. And when it really does dawn on Peter what's going on, he says, Lord, well, if that's what's going on here, wash everything, my knees, my ankles, my elbows, my hands, all the way up to my head. And Jesus says, no, if I do this, you're clean. And all of you are clean through the grace of God, except the one, the one who will betray me. Now, Judas is in some ways, far more than Thomas, the most enigmatic character in any of the Gospels. What was it that led Judas to betray Jesus after traveling with him, being one of the twelve, seeing all the miracles? What could have possessed him to do that? Well, possessed is the right word. We're told in John 13 that the devil entered him and there was night. 
he was led down that path by the one who was at the end of the path in the Adam and Eve story, that wily serpent, the devil himself. Humanly speaking, it is entirely possible that Judas became disillusioned with Jesus because Jesus was not fulfilling his own view of what a Messiah should do. He may have expected Jesus to come to town and conquer. Instead, he came to town to die. And that was profoundly disillusioning to many disciples. Look at the story in Luke 24 of the disciples on Emmaus Road walking out of town and ironically telling the risen Jesus, we had hoped, past tense, that he would be the one to redeem Israel. But that death on the cross, boy, that scotched that rumor. He couldn't be the one to redeem Israel if he died on a cross. Crucified Messiah was an oxymoron to the expectations and hopes of Jews in the first century A.D. The last thing they needed was another crucified Jew is the way they thought about it. No, they needed a mighty warrior. It's like George MacDonald puts it. We were looking for a king to slay our foes and lift us high, but thou camest a little baby thing that made a woman cry. So here's where I tell you. John 13 reminds us, Jesus didn't come to meet our expectations of what a Savior looks like. He came to meet our needs, and that's what this is about. I hope you enjoyed Dr. Witherington's uh, synopsis of the week that we just concluded together. Uh, as we draw this session to a close, I want to invite you to join me again as we close in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, your eternal presence is hidden behind the veil of nature, enlightens the mind of all people, and was made flesh in Jesus Christ our Lord. I thank you that he has left me an example to follow in his steps. Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Jesus said, strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He said, do good and lend, expecting to get nothing in return. He said, love your enemies. He said, do not fear, only believe. He said, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be open for you. Oh God, move my heart to follow all of Christ's words in this way. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, my friends, enjoy your weekend. Find a place to worship, a way to worship on Sunday, and I'll see you right back here live 7 o'clock Monday night as we continue our journey through the Gospel of John. God bless.